Well, this here is a pretty cool find. This is my very first Packard Bell ever. I've never owned a Packard Bell. I've never found one. Mainly because I've never looked for one and I've never wanted one. <laughs> I hate them. I absolutely do. I, they, you know, I grew up fixing computers from about, uh, I started fixing them in like 95 and uh, I never stopped. And, um, I became like the neighborhood computer guru. Now, I grew up in a fairly low income neighborhood and Packard Bell aggressively marketed towards these types of people, the computer newbies, the low income, um, you know, people just getting their first computers ever and not knowing how to use them. So Packard Bell created software packages to make it easy for their customers to use their computers called the Packard Bell Navigator. Well, I serviced a lot of these machines because that's what I did. It was quick, easy money, and I learned a lot doing it. But Packard Bells were just so poorly made that um, they seemed to be the most frequently uh, problematic machines, at least from my, from my, from my experience, for a couple of reasons. Packard Bell used the lowest quality materials money could buy at the time. That kept their prices low and that kept their orders coming in the door. At one point they had the highest DOA or dead on arrival rate of any manufacturer and um, they were even sold by Walmart. Walmart sold Packard Bells. If you wanted a Packard Bell you went to Walmart. This was in a time when buying a computer from a department store was considered a mortal sin. But for all its quirks and shortfalls, Packard Bell was not a very bad manufacturer for a couple of reasons. Uh, Packard Bell opened up a new world of computing to people who otherwise would be shut out of it um, through their Packard Bell Navigator software, which made learning the GUI a, a user-friendly experience, at least for the Windows uh, end of things. Um, you know, these machines were affordable. Um, ultimately, you know, they were sold at places like Walmart and Rent-A-Center. Rent-A-Center, yes, Rent-A-Center. <laughs> this was like their number one product of the time period. Now this 1994 example is the Packard Bell Legend 233. This is a a fairly budget-end machine. It doesn't have multimedia features that would have that were starting to become more common in the mid '90s. Um, it doesn't have a sound card. It does not have a CD-ROM drive. Usually, those two were added hand in hand. But it does have a built-in modem. And let's pop it open. And we'll see what's inside. But I'm going to do some stuff to it that has never been done before. Now this machine had never been previously serviced. I actually cracked open the warranty seal just a few minutes ago for the first time ever. And uh, I felt like I was committing a crime. But you know what? That's what we do here at B Bishop PCM, right? Anyway, let's take a look at this low-end motherboard. Now, when the 486 processor was really the dominant chip for desktop computing, um, the Intel Pentium was was just coming around in '94. I think it was a, it was really hitting popular in '95. But the 486 processor came in several flavors. You had the the SX, the DX, and the DX2, and later on the DX4. Many of these lower end desktop pro, uh, motherboards. Um, offered several chip options uh, to the manufacturer of the PC. Now this motherboard had a factory option of, that is factory, not end user, of having a soldered on built-in 46SX processor. And then in more cases than one, you would also have the expansion socket. The onboard processor was typically a low-end chip, like an SX or maybe even a DX on a higher-end board. And the expansion socket 
was used for a coprocessor or an overdrive processor. And in extreme cases, you could disable the onboard processor and actually run your processor right here. That's how my system was set up in 97 when I had when I got my very first 486 machine um, it came with a soldered on SX chip and I took a 486 DX2 from the trash and stuck it in my overdrive socket disabled the onboard chip and I had a 486 DX266 processor DX2 was a clock double processor for those of you not familiar with the SX DX thing the SX was a DX let me explain that. The DX processor had a built-in math coprocessor or floating point unit. When in the manufacturing process the coprocessor was a faulty one or had failed, the chip was then remarked as an SX or a lower end processor. So you had your SX as your base budget processor, your DX as your mid-grade, think of it as an i5, and the DX2 was like your i7 or your higher end processor that would have been used for um, high end applications and uh, performance, gaming, all that happy stuff. So in a nutshell, we have a motherboard without the onboard chip. It was never installed and it has the SX in a socket 2 ZIF socket, zero insertion force. So we lift up this lever and we can pull the processor right out and there it is look at all the shiny gold plated pins this is a ceramic package which isn't something they do anymore now they're aluminum and uh... and green board but you can clearly see that it is a 486SX running at 33 megahertz the 25 megahertz processors were available for even more budget conscious consumers. So we just put that right back in, oriented properly, we'll lock it down. There we go. Now what makes this process or this motherboard really sucky is the fact that it only has one memory socket or a slot. Which probably means the maximum amount of memory that this thing can handle is probably north of a uh, 16 to 32 gigab uh, megabytes, sorry, megabytes. It has onboard memory, about 8 megabytes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I see 5, I see 6, 7, 8 memory chips in a row. That's your system memory. Video memory goes here in these uh, sockets. And you have four expansion sockets, uh, slots. These are 16-bit expansion slots, and we're going to use one for the first time ever. As it just so happens, I have a Creative Labs CT40 something something or other sitting here that I just, just found in the bin. That's the trash bin, folks. I found it in the trash. And I saved it because I knew someday I was going to need it. Now, I need a micro-channel sound blaster more than anything in the world, but I can't seem to find one of those. That's for the IBM tower. I can't find one to save my life. But that's okay. I have a 16-bit sound blaster that I'm going to stick into this stupid Packer Bell because I can. All right. Where'd it go? Oh, it's on my bed. All right. Tough freaking duh. We've got our sound card bolted in place. A um, couple of words of wisdom while we're here. Now, this machine is 18 years old. What happens to clock batteries after 18 years? They disintegrate. And this is no exception. The onboard clock battery, which is a Varda 3.6 volt nickel metal hydride rechargeable, is leaking. And it has to be yanked out. Not today, but later. Um, this battery is causing corrosion and damage to the motherboard, but it doesn't look too bad. It hasn't eaten through those tracers quite yet, but it's getting there. So what do we do? Well, the proper way to fix this would be to pull the motherboard out, desolder it from behind, yank the battery, and because most motherboards had an auxiliary battery connector, and this one has one right there, uh, it's on, uh, let's see, J28. 
J28 is a 3 pin connector. This is for an external battery. So I'm going to try to find, I think I can still get one, a battery that will just plug right into that and replace the onboard battery. If I do nothing, usually by now, um, it's already beyond the point of return, of no return. <laughs> And by now, that battery would have leaked and destroyed the board, and it would be all over. Curtains for this machine. One of the side effects of a dead clock battery on an older machine, let's say pre-1996-ish, is that um, the hard drive parameters will have to be re-entered manually upon startup. Because they didn't have auto drive configurations back then. The BIOS was pretty much a manual affair, which required jumper settings for most of the important stuff and um, manual data entry for things like hard drive dimensions and parameters. Luckily, every drive manufactured, uh, at least up until recently, has had all the parameters nicely printed on the label. So we've got to write this all down. We have 1,001 cylinders. We have 15 heads. We have 34 sectors per track. And we have 261.3 megabytes. And I believe this drive would have been sold as a 250 megabyte hard drive. So, there we go. Interestingly enough, the machine that I had in 97 had the 500 megabyte version of this hard drive. It was the same basic drive, but a higher capacity, which is kind of nice. And if any of you happen to have one of these Packard Bells, Legend, whatever, something or other, and it has this board on it, even if it's not the same board, but it has the same switches, that's turbo and reset. I need that board. Because what happened was, when I first took the cover off, I accidentally pulled the, co the cover upward too early, and I snapped off both of these switch covers. Unfortunately, all of the contacts went flying along with the springs, and they were swept up by the janitor at work just shortly after that. So I am in need of one of these boards. The machine is perfect otherwise. So let's take a look at some other features that we've got going on. We have a built-in 5 and a quarter inch floppy dryer. This is a factory option, made in May of 93. We have a factory five and a, or three and a half inch floppy drive built in, which is a big deal. 1.44 meg, this is a 1.2 meg. And we have this stupid funky power switch. This is why I don't like Packard Bells, because their cases are so flimsy. This power switch requires the case to be on a perfectly flat surface to operate. And what it does is it presses a plastic appendage here. It's one piece, molded piece, it goes from here all the way to here. And when depressed, it presses, of course, the power button on the power supply. You can see the power supply clearly moving due to lack of support and um, it makes for interesting uh, issues when you're trying to power the machine on because it barely works. I'll show you that in a second. All right, now we're gonna fire it up. I pretty much know what to expect. I'm using my IBM peripherals on this one. That's pretty much what I expected. It has... Three, well, really, three megabytes of onboard RAM. Four megabytes, I believe. So we need to run the system setup. No boot devices. F2 to continue. So, definitely needs a new battery. We know that much. If get A, should be a three and a half inch. If get B, is a five and a quarter inch 1.2 meg hard disk one. And we're gonna do um, let's see. We're gonna do a user. 
Actually, I think it has a built-in uh, like size of like 250 user-defined two. You know, user-defined one. And then we're going to set our cylinders to 1001. Heads to 15. Sectors 34. That's 249 megabytes. That's what we've got. Onboard RAM. Video type is VGA EGA. Once I get a new battery, that'll correct all that. Um, and color not interlaced. I think I said. So uh, we're gonna F four to save. Let's see what happens. Now I have some memory here that I'm going to try. 72 pin. I might have the, the floppy drives reversed. Now we're going to boot. I think drive A could be this one. So let's go ahead and uh, boot it up. Looks like it's running Windows 3.1. But this is where things get really cool. Now, I've been wanting to show this to you guys for some time. I just haven't really had a second to do it. I'm sorry about the camera. I have, um... I think if I turn off, uh... Here's my menu. If I turn off the, um... Let's see... Steady shot. Yeah, if I turn off steady shot, there we go. That's better. What we have here is something really peculiar. This is the factory build of this machine. It is untouched. It's almost as if the machine had never been used. It has all the original software, Microsoft Works. I sincerely hope this is a sample document. Or somebody writing a story. Yeah, this is not a sample. This is somebody's actual work. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and close. I've never seen this before. This is like, this is a blooper, if there ever was one. Um... <laughs> What the hell am I looking at? Alright, we're going to close this. And go back to what we were doing. That wasn't expected. That was somebody's personal story or something. Um, okay. So there's that. Prodigy. Prodigy Internet was... It was the biggest thing since... Sliced Bread in the early 90s. It was the internet before it was the internet. Before there was World Wide Web, you had services like Prodigy and AOL that were gated communities that you could connect to with your modem. They were paid services. It was like 25, 30 bucks a month or they would charge you, I think back then it was more of an hourly thing. And you could get information, you could contact people. This is where chat rooms became popular. This is where um, special interest groups became popular. Um, it was such a different era back then. Um, but unfortunately, it's dead, and we can't use it, and that's it. But Prodigy, I actually had a cousin who had a Prodigy account in 94, and it was so cool because you just plug your computer into a modem and, or pl I'm sorry, into a plug your modem into the phone phone jack, and you can. Here's a demo. Let's take a look at the demo. I haven't installed the sound card driver yet.
definitely an advance. This is, uh, this is cool. This is the internet before it was the internet. As we know it today. Of course, it's... Can I advance through things? So I can do, this is what the weather map looks like. You can, you can check your weather online. News, weather, sports, consumer reports, computer information. I believe you could trade stocks back then. Now this is a vast improvement over the text-based internet that preceded it. If you guys request enough of this, I'll, I'll, I'll probably do the whole demo for you guys. We've got to move on. We've got a lot to cover. Um, it did have a printer installed. LBP430, I believe, was a Canon. And, uh, let's see, Packard Bell. It still has the factory disk image software on it. I can make images of this disk. Packard Bell Demo and Packard Bell Navigator. Let's take a look at the Navigator. This is what made Packard Bells easier to use for new users. Um, the Navigator allowed you to customize... It was like Microsoft Bob on steroids. Basically allowed you to... Um, Actually, I think this is an earlier version, but later versions allowed you to create rooms that contained your software. Um, you could go into your bedroom to launch a, a reading application, or uh, go into the game room and launch games, I think. But this is, um, this is good stuff. All right, so we're, we're done with that one. Can lock the machine. How can I escape? There is no escape. All right. There it is. Exit. To, oh, I wanted to do, oh, exit the Windows. There it is. It even has the factory desktop background still set. Look at that. Doesn't get much better than this. The Packard Bell demo. All right, let's get that sound card installed. I'm sure there's some more cool stuff I can show you. So we're still uh, running the demo. <laughs> this is, yeah, good stuff right here. Now, it says high capacity RAM, but it doesn't give me an uh, actual number here. Let's see if we can exit the program. Come on. So we've got about four megabytes of internal RAM. Come on. There we go. How do you... Oh, I have to control it. Delete. This is like the demo, the store demo thing. And, uh, yeah, it's hard to get out of. So let's do control, delete. And exit it that way. There we go. Packard Bell support. Wow. <laughs> nice. All right. Nothing in a startup. Oh, we have the best of, or I'm sorry, the entire Windows Entertainment Pack. That's pretty cool. Oh, well, fine. Screw you then. Minesweeper. Where's Ski Free? Oh, I guess it doesn't have Ski Free. It has a game called Rodent. Tutorial Navigator. We went through that already. Let's see. Let's see if we can't get some more memory in this machine. Um, so right now, let's 
see what MSD has to say. Assuming it's installed. Yep. Yeah, it, it, it has, let's see, XMS, 2 gigs, 4 gigs, hmm, so, I mean megs, I, I mean megabytes when I say gigs, so, so yeah, alright, well, let's try to get some more memory in there, definitely, so we're just going to shut her down. This was actually a concern back in those days. But the type of metal on the contacts used on the memory and on the slot had to match. If it didn't, over time, the dissimilar metals would react. That was at least a popular, uh, I wouldn't say legend, but a fact in some ways, kind of, sort of. I've never seen it happen, personally but I assure you it happened. Um, these don't match, by the way. One's tin, one's uh, copper-plated, but that's okay. Or gold-plated. All right, let's uh, see if this thing fires up and see if the memory even works. I don't even know what kind of memory I just put in. I don't even know what it, it was. EDO or fast page or what size it is. I just wanted to see if I get anything out of it. Let's see what, uh, what we get. You know, it's posting. So we had about four megs before. We now have about 12 megs. So that's like a 12 meg module, right? The 12, no, wait. Let's see. That was an eight megabyte module. Pretty cool. So let's try to fix that floppy startup error. Um, let's see here. That's nice. Let's see if uh, drive A was our 5.25 and drive B is our 3.5 inch. So we're going to do escape and F4. Oh, good news, I found the driver for the sound card, so we're going to put that in, and uh, good old creativelabs.com still has the driver for Windows 3.1, which is pretty awesome of them. It still isn't working. I'll play around with it. This might have something to do with that, too. My bad. Success. Okay, let's see if the Sound Blaster driver works. I downloaded um, from my Mac. <clears throat> oh crap, I think that's just an updated driver, not a real one. I kind of wonder when the last time this driver was actually downloaded was. It dates back to 1995, I believe. Oh, and it's decompressing on the disk, so maybe it'll run out of space. I hope not. And this, my friends, is why when you throw away a computer, regardless of how old it is or whether it works or not, or whether you think someone will access it or not, that you must destroy your data. What I am seeing on this machine are the workings of a nasty divorce that occurred in approximately the year 2000. 
Yeah. I'm talking lawyer information. Custody battle documents. Unbelievable. No wonder she divorced him. He owned a Packard Bell. Well, so far I've experienced a floppy drive failure. Yes, a floppy drive failure. Just was working fine and now, bam, it doesn't want to work. And I don't have another one of this color. Oy. Oh, 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 and it gets better. This memory module was working fine and it just, bam, blew up. <laughs> Luckily I had another one. And that's working okay. I'm beginning to think it's uh, done for. I, I, you know, um, I don't know what to say. I, I mean, everything else is, is still working okay. It's just the floppy drive is acting up now, and all the cables are well seated. Get it into BIOS. I can only seem to get it into BIOS if I disconnect the. Um, floppy drive. Can't seem to get it in otherwise. Let's try this. You see it keeps doing a stuck key failure and maybe if I try it at the memory test. Let's see what that does for me. I just don't believe the extent of which I am having issues with this machine. It does the floppy seek. It will not go in unless I trip the BIOS. This sucks, man. This sucks. I was all excited, too. I'm going to double check my BIOS settings. It turns out the 3.5 inch is set to drive A. 3.5 inch 1.44, 5 and a quarter inch 1.2, drive B. I just don't believe it. I mean, what a pile. Hmm. Modem port, COM1, serial COM2, T, that should be set to bi-directional. Copy, enabled, enables. Alright. Page 2 of 2. So that's it. I mean, it, it's just, it's just asinine, man. Um cabling. How are we doing on cabling? So the twisted end is on the three and a half inch like it's supposed to be. Uh, there's not a cabling problem there. You know guys, I, <laughs> I... Ah, I'm so mad. 